Hello everyone, in this video I will show how to build this electronic speed controller for slot cars. I wanted to start racing slot cars with my kids, but I noticed that the controller's prices are very high. You start from 140 euro up to 400 euro easy for some programmability. Of course, they are much more powerful than the small controller we used to have when I was a kid. But still, I thought they were too much expensive, so I decided to build my own. The speed controller it is based on an ESP32 dual core microcontroller. It has a supply voltage from 8 to 18 volt and it has a 40 amp motor controller from Infineon, so it is protected without fuses. The trigger position is read by a magnetic sensor from Infineon with E square C interface every 500 nanosecond, providing a reliable and compact solution for the trigger position. PWM switching is up to 5 kHz synchronous or asynchronous, providing more freedom for the motor reactions. The OLED display and the rotary encoder are giving high freedom for the parameter selection. You can save multiple model parameter and recall it on the next race. And you can always upgrade the firmware if you desire to introduce new parameters. Now we are playing around with derivative control. You can adjust the trigger travel by adjusting the screw here. And you can adjust the trigger tension, how much rigid it is, by adjusting the spring inside with this screw here. The total cost for the speed controller will be approximately 18 euro, including the 3D printed parts, and 27 euro if you include also cables and plugs. This is for 10 pieces slot. Of course, if you build only one, two, three pieces, you will pay much more because of the shipping cost. The realization of this project was possible thanks to JLC PCB providing the PCBs and assembly and to the Bamboo Lab providing the printers for this very cool multicolor printing. Thanks to JLC PCB I have been able to pass from a disaster prototype to a professional looking device. All the passive components are mounted by JLC PCB and I will take care of mounting the rest. To order by JLC PCB is quite simple. I did my project with Daltium, for instance, and there is a step-by-step -step guide in the JLC PCB site in order to produce the Gerber file, drill files, a bill of material from Altium in the preferred format for JLC PCB. Once you have your file, you just have to upload it into the JLC PCB at Gerber file and then start to upload the bill of material. For the bill of material, I highly recommend you to use only the basic part so you don't pay any extra cost. JLC PCB provides also a view of how the components will be mounted and here you can adjust uh, uh, the component which you note that are not in the right position. For instance, this uh, transistor is uh, rotated by 180 degrees. One last comment for JLC PCB. They sent me also this super cool multicolor silk screen PCB. I think this was made with the Easy EDA while I'm using Altium, so I have to check if this is possible also to obtain with Altium. And now let's start assembly the PCB with the missing components. I would start with the ESP32 module. Cut the long pin strip with a clipper. Then you can start soldering the OLED display e square C. Then you have to solder the rotary encoder. The buzzer. The motor controller. the magnetic sensor and the reverse polarity MOSFET. And now you can download the firmware. Just select the ESP32 development module. 
The OLED display should turn on and the buzzer should beep. And now let's talk about the 3D printed part. This part has been printed with the Bamboo Lab A1 with the AMS system for multicolor. Initial prototype has been printed using my old Ender 3, but finally I was tired of printing one part at a time using the SD card, no Wi Fi, noisy and some print quality because I was using the 06mm nozzle in order to print faster. So I decided to upgrade to a Bamboo Lab A1, but I will make a dedicated video for a comparison A1 against Ender 3. Is it worth to pay extra money and upgrade the printer? I used Fusion 360 to design the enclosure, starting from the PCB. To print it with the Bamboo Lab Studio is super trivial. You just right click on the component, save as mesh, 3MF format, one file per body, OK. This will save all the 3D printed files in the folder you selected. Then you select the file that you just generated and you drag and drop it into the Bamboo Studio. Here they will be overlapped, but you just place Auto Rotate and then Auto Arrange. You can see they are very close to each other, but this is intentional to save printing time. And now let's change the color appearance. I want to have the two sides black. So this is a handle dot. Click here on the number and you just select the color you prefer. The two. All the colors loaded in the multicolor system of the printer are already visible here and they are automatically updated with the RFD tag just by pressing this button, sync filament. Now you can slice it. You can have a look if it looks all good. And then you send to the printer by printing plate. That's it. And now we just need to wait for the complete setup to be printed. And you can monitor the status from the Bamboo Lab A1 web camera, also from your mobile phone. Glue the top and bottom rounding to the handle and help aligning with the screw in the hole. Then start inserting all the threaded inserts with the help of the soldering iron. Put a threaded insert also in the slide, which will help you adjusting the trigger tensioning. Press a threaded insert also inside the trigger. And finally an M5 threaded insert also for the trigger and position adjusting. Place also a spring around the M5 screw in order to prevent it from unscrewing. With the help of some heat you can insert a bearing for the trigger. And with some glue you can also fix the bearing to the external case. Now assemble also the tensioning slide and the, with the screw and the, with the washer that is helping the screw keeping it in the right position. Now connect the spring to the moving slide and to the trigger. Connect the spring to the trigger and push the, the trigger inside the bearing. And on the other side you can use a washer and a screw in order to keep everything assembled together. For the magnet you have to avoid wrap around, so set the device into calibration mode. Those vertically magnets you can put something like a blade on the top of it and they will try to stick, this is their polarization. And then you have to find the place that is not giving a wrap around, you see, is giving wrap around, so you have to keep it in this position. I made this magnet that I know that if I keep it in this position, I can put it on the top of this and, uh, and glue the magnet in the right position, so in order to avoid wrap around. Now, I just put the magnet I need to glue here, and I put some glue on the top. Okay, this is the needed position, and then 
I just pull it like this. And this is the needed position. You can also perform a test if you want. Now wrap around, perfect. There are two pads in order to solder a 2200 microfarad capacitor to help the power supply when you have the peak current while accelerating, but it's not mandatory. Choose at least a 16 volt rating. Let's put a single screw in order to hold the PCB in place. The rest of the screws will also help to close the enclosure. Now, let's solder the cable, observing the polarity. There is a reverse polarity protection, but it's not preventing you from swapping all the type of polarities, so only the plus and minus of the power supply. About the thickness of the cable, I used AWG16 or AWG14. In Italy, we use the vintage magic plug. I don't know in your region which plug is used. In this page, I'm showing the wiring connection in Italy. Please be aware of the wiring color. They are very misleading. I don't know who decided this stupid color, but uh, should be red for minus, black for wiper, and white for the uh, plus. On my remotes, I'm sorry, I'm going against these standards. Okay, we are almost done. You have to close the remote and you're good to go. Let's have a look at what the menu of the remote control has today as a parameter. There is the sensibility, which is the minimum speed that you will achieve as soon as you touch the trigger. If I increase it, for instance, 60% at the beginning, the motor will start already at 60% throttle. Then we have the brake level, which means how strong the motor will break when I release completely the throttle. In this case, it's 90%. If I remove it, if I make it zero, you see, the motor keeps on spinning when I release the throttle. Then I have the anti-spin. This is how many milliseconds it will take for the PWM of the, of the controller to reach the 100% in case I press at full speed the throttle. In this case, I have 50 milliseconds. If you want to avoid the spinning of the car, you just increase it up to, uh, I don't know, 200 milliseconds. This will provide a ramp to the motor. You see, much softer ramp. Then I have the curve mapping the throttle position toward the motor uh, speed, let's say. If you want a more reactive motor, you go to a very high curve like this one, and the motor will start spinning fast early. If you want a sort of exponential curve, you just keep it low at the beginning and then you give it a punch at the end. So all the maximum range is on the last part of the trigger. Then you have the drag brake. The drag brake is something similar to the remote control cars. The full brake for a slot speed controller is achieved only when you release completely the throttle. But if you go to a previous point like 10-20% of the throttle, usually you have no brake like this. If you want the, the speed controller to control the motor and force it also to a lower position like 10%, 20%, you increase the drag brake. In this case, I will give you 100% and so. See, even if I don't reach the zero position, the motor decreases to, I don't know, 10% of the throttle. Then we have the drag brake type. If we want, we can have it always enabled. So if you go to the 10%, you are always in drag brake mode, okay? If you put it to the deceleration, the drag brake will be applied only when releasing the throttle and not when accelerating. Then we have the PWM frequency. You can go from 200 Hz up to 5 kHz, and you can hear it from the noise of the motor. This is the 5 kHz. 1 kHz, 200 Hz. 
and then you can select the car and save the model. Let's say that all the changes you want to save it into your remote control. You press, you rename the model like uh, you call it uh, everything you like and then you go to OK and with this you save the name of the car and you save it all the parameters so you can go from one model to the other like the, now let's choose another model and you see you see all the limits are changed at the moment if you change a parameter like this one in order to keep it when you remove the power supply you need to go to you need to go to save in order to calibrate the trigger, you have to keep pressed the rotary encoder while turning on the power supply. And you will go into the calibration page. Here you have to press and release the trigger some time and then you press it again. And the trigger is now calibrated. You have to perform throttle calibration every time you adjust the throttle travel screw. Ready, go! That's it for today. We will provide below in the description in few weeks, because we are still working on it, the link for a project where you will find the Fusion 360 files, we will find the software and the schematic, the Altium project for the schematic, Gerber files and the bill of material in order to purchase the PCB on JLC PCB. That's it. Have a nice day. See you soon.